Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Coleman. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. And I want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I want to thank the Department of Economics and the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute as well for hosting today's celebration. We are here today to hear from and to honor Ann Osborne Krieger. While here at the U, Professor Krieger established herself as one of CLA's most distinguished faculty. She is a giant in the field of economics, and it is truly a delight to be presenting her today with the Honorary De Doctor of Science degree from the University of Minnesota. Professor Krieger taught here in Minnesota from 1959 to 1982. In her time at the U, she demonstrated the intellectual rigor and willingness to quote, take on the establishment, as one of her nomination letters puts it, that would characterize her subsequent academic and public work. Her public leadership roles have included serving as chief economist at the World Bank, as well as first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Her work has truly brought honor to our Department of Economics, and it is part of a long tradition of excellence in that department. Indeed, nine of the University of Minnesota's 22, 22 Nobel laureates are associated with our Department of Economics. The department's international distinction was reinforced in 2010 by the founding of the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute. To together, the department and Heller Hurwitz produce leading edge research and build a bridge between world class economic research, public discourse, and public policy. Professor Krieger, on behalf of the college, I want to welcome you back to the College of Liberal Arts, the Department of Economics, and the University of Minnesota. We are honored to have the opportunity to recognize your years of outstanding scholarship and your trailblazing, trailblazing leadership. I would also like to thank many of Professor Krieger's friends, family, former students, and colleagues who have traveled from Hong Kong, Spain, Argentina, and all points in the United States to be with us today. Uh, you are indeed a testament to the impact of Pro Professor Krieger's work, and you underline how deeply deserving she is of today's honor. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, Regent Michael Hsu and Executive Vice President and Provost Karen Hansen, who will be joining us in a bit, for their support of the College of Liberal Arts and the Economics Department over the years. At this point, I will turn things over to uh, Chris Phelan, the Chair of the Department of Economics, and he will have the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor Krieger. Thank you, Dean Coleman. It is my distinct privilege to introduce Professor Krieger today. For 50 years, Professor Krieger has led the field of international economics. She has pioneered theories, mentored students, and advised governments. As Dean Coleman mentioned, Professor Krieger began her career at the University of Minnesota in 1959 and spent over 20 years teaching and developing her field shaping research on international economics right here in our department. She is perhaps best known for her work on the concept of rent seeking, which describe activities designed to increase one's share of existing wealth without creating new wealth, a concept which continues to shape the way we approach international development today. Her influential 1974 article, The Political Economy of the Rent-Seeking Society, was cited by the American Economic Association as one of the best 20 papers published in the association's first 100 years. We are particularly pleased to recognize Professor Krieger today for the way she has woven together theory and practice, research and policy. She has used her significant theoretical and empirical contributions to advance the field of international economics and also to improve the lives of millions of people all over the world. Moreover, Professor Krieger embodies the intellectual rigor and unwillingness to accept the status quo, quo that we strive to instill in all of our students. We, look very much, we very much look forward to what Professor Krieger has to share with us today. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Armin Chotsky, who will be moderating our question and answer session with Professor Krieger. Dr. Chotsky is both a distinguished University of Minnesota Economics PhD alum, we're always proud of our PhDs, uh, 
and a Heller Hurwitz advisory board member. He was a student of Professor Krieger and later went on to work with her at the World Bank. Please welcome Dr. Toski and Professor Ann Krieger. Well, thank you very much for those nice words and that nice introduction to both of you. But thanks so many of you for coming. It's wonderful to see lots of old friends and many of whom are still friends and all that. And uh, for me, uh, this is, I suppose, what you could call a sentimental journey. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, although I must admit that I got myself lost on the University of Minnesota campus yesterday, which is something I did not think was possible, but I managed it. <clears throat> and it was not my fault, but I won't spend much time on that. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about what I've called Trump's follies. And in particular, I'll to talk a little bit about some of the issues that come up and why I think it's important. Um, international trade and trade policy used to be one of those arcane subjects where nobody really noticed, and if there was some news, it was sort of on one of the inside pages of the business section of the paper. It just wasn't something that made uh, much notice here. But the Trump administration has changed all that. The tr trade is very much on everyone's mind, and the news is very much there. And it has, the Trump administration has seen to getting us to be the front page, which for those of us in international economics, if we were doing the right thing, we could be very proud of, but instead it's a problem. Uh, in the US, US we've had uh, a real eye-opener in the sense that we always had open trade, we were leading the system, uh, and every economist has been fairly relaxed about things that have happened even now to a point where I'm worried, because we just haven't, we don't know how bad this can be a lot of, some of those of you who come from other countries do know better than those of us in the U.S. Uh, what this can lead to. So I want to talk about this, and I'll talk a little bit just generally about why an open trade system is a good system. But then I want to go and I want to just illustrate what's wrong uh, with, with, with the case of the iron uh, and steel tariff quotas in the U.S. right now, and to illustrate that it's not just a matter of textbooks, and we're very good at that, we can draw the diagrams, and they're right, and they're important, but also to show that the nuts and bolts of a system like this, of the way it has to be administered, and the complications it brings up, lead to problems far beyond those uh, that we normally think about uh, when we don't think that uh, everything is perfectly free trade. So let me start. I taught like everybody else who does international, I taught the theory of comparative advantage for years, and I still think that free trade is almost always the appropriate policy. There are a few exceptions for defense, national security, and drugs and things like that. But on the whole, I would teach it again. I would also teach, as economists do, that even when there are factors that suggest intervention with trade is desirable, there's almost always an intervention that will achieve the same objectives, if they're achievable at all, uh, with greater benefit and lower cost to the consumers. And even if not, and the intervention might be beneficial if administered by platonic officials who are uninfluenced by political pressures or lobbying, Consideration always has to be given, I think, to the possibility or even the likelihood that those pressures and the things that they result in will mean that the intervention, which may have started out very well intended, ends up quite the opposite. So that's sort of the theme of where we are going. I want to add another set of considerations, however, to the idea that comparative advantage is optimal and that we want free trade and all that, because I think the arguments that we've made for free trade are very good ones. There's no problem there but I think there are even stronger alternatives against the alternatives. The alternatives, so to say, are even worse. The best defense of, my, of free trade, in my view, is not comparative advantage, although it's a good one, but it's like Churchill's defense of democracy. It's the least worst system. And in the ways in which the alternatives are bad are what make it so. And of course, I have, in this case, steel in mind. Let me note, however, just several positives. I don't want to leave them out. First of all, all the advanced countries, all the rich countries, all the ones that are highly productive have relatively low levels of protection, an average of 3% tariffs on their imports of manufacturers only. And 3% is a lot. We shouldn't have it and all that, but 3% is 3%. It's not a huge number. Uh, and that's across all of the advanced members of the WTO. And it's no coincidence that the low trade, the low trade barrier countries are the ones that have the higher incomes. They go together. 
Second, almost all of those developing countries and emerging markets that have achieved sustained rapid growth have greatly lowered their trade barriers. They have also opened up their economies sufficiently so that incentives for export production and sale of import competing goods are at least as strong. They don't let import competing incentives be so great as to rule the other out. Many of those developing countries were very, very poor economic performers earlier on before they abandoned their inner-oriented closed economy policies. Economists now show that Japan's rapid growth did not start until the 1960s and that the earlier policies, and even some in the 1960s, had in fact been protecting the losers rather than promoting the winners, which of course is what it was supposed to be. Industrial policy to spur the winners did not work and hasn't worked anywhere. This is not to say that high levels of subsidization or protection never ever for anybody do any good. They, they sometimes can encourage the start or rapid development of one or even a few successful import substituting industries. But it is to say that growth has been slow in those countries because even though there were a couple of successes, the costs incurred by the other activities were high enough to make sure that they more than offset whatever gains there could be from the few, few and usually far between successes. Uh, you know, and I'll just remind you, however, because it's important to remember, that the comparative advantage argument is very simple and very straightforward. It always pays in an economy to have the economy doing what people in the economy do relatively best. Relatively is the key word. A lawyer may be able to type better than his stenographer, but it still pays to hire the stenographer. And the reason is simple. And a country could be better at producing everything than another country, without any question. But it still pays to produce more of the things it produces relatively better and to export them to pay for the imports of the good that they, that they can import because they can obtain the Im more imports per unit of export than they can by spending the resources on import competing goods themselves. Next thing I just want to note is that the United States led the world, and this is important, in opening up the global trading system after World War II. Until several years ago, <clears throat> I was very proud of my country in that regard. It was important, not perfect, but important. Had le leadership was important and all that. And the rules of international trade were agreed upon in the Inter World Trade Organization. And after eight rounds of multilateral trade negotiations, there were major reductions in levels of protection, especially for manufactured goods, and almost universal abandonment of quantitative restrictions, which had been very harmful. They were all but eliminated in most countries. The opening up and integration of the world economy continued and supported more than a half a century of the most rapid economic growth and poverty elimination the world has ever seen with the most equitable growth in the sense of sharing across countries so that almost all countries partook of it. It was not just the West after 1945. It was, by and large, almost everybody, with a few exceptions, but not too many. And U.S. leadership was key. But unfortunately, in the past two years, the American administration has refused to examine the evidence of trade's benefits and has not only abandoned leadership, but re adopted a hostile attitude and stance toward the system. But I don't want to talk in generalities, which I could do, but rather be more specific and focus on the arrangements with regard to steel. And partly I want to do so because it was one of the first. Partly I want to do so because even some very good economists have said, well, they'll raise costs 2 or 3%, but that's all right. Uh, or what shouldn't make much difference to our growth rate and all that. And I want to challenge you on that and say that I think uh, we have opened the Pandora's box that goes much further. Uh, as you know, the administration imposed a 25% tariff on steel, also on aluminum, but I'm not going to talk about that, imports. It recognized, however, that some types of steel were needed in a particular production process and indicated that requests for, as they called it, exceptions, and I may sometimes say exceptions or waivers or exemptions, uh, if the steel was not available domestically, a firm could, could apply and get it. I'll talk back to that. It also demand, demanded that the South Korean Free Trade Agreement, CHORUS, be renegotiated, and I have the word in quotes, because I don't think that's the right word to describe what happens when, for example, a landlord leases out his, your apartment to you at $500 a month with a two-year lease and you pay the money and he comes back three months later and says, this, this is not valid at all. I'm going to renegotiate. Unless you pay me $1,000 a month, you're out. 
this is we, not something we do, but this is what we did with the North Koreans, what we did with NAFTA, and so on and so forth. And I have difficulty with the word renegotiation. It's, as far as I'm concerned, a break, violation of a contract. Uh, in the so-called renegotiated agreement, South Korea was to be exempt from the 25% tar tariff on steel, but had to agree to commit to cutting its exports of steel to the U.S. to 70% of the average of the prior three years. Okay, and, and of course they were, had been growing rapidly, an average rate of 8% a year. So, and because of that, the commitment meant reducing Korean export levels to levels below what they'd been even two years before. Even administration of tariffs is challenging when there are multiple rates, and there are on steel. Steel does not have one flat import rate. There are different rates for different kinds of steel. Importers, of course, are going to try and classify as much steel as they can at the lower rates, which is human nature. So commodity type has to be checked when goods are imported. And once there are countries whose exports are subject to a lower or zero tariff, and when different types of commodities enter at different rates, even more must be done and documented and verified. Bear that in mind as I describe what has to be done in the steel exemptions. However, when some countries are subject simply to tariffs, <clears throat> and others, such as South Korea, to tariff quotas, administration becomes even more complicated. And this is a country that is not used to doing this kind of thing very much, although we have a few exceptions. It's easy to show, and we all do it in class, uh, that for every import quota, there's a e tariff equivalent. We all teach that. Uh, and the proof is very straightforward. Suppose I put on a tariff of 5%, and so imports come in at 100. Uh, then uh, we're at 100, and they go to 95. Now instead, I put on a quote of 95. Well, the price will go up 5%, the amount of the tariff. Very simple, very straightforward, very obvious. One way you go this way and find it, the other way you go that way and find it, the same number. But a tariff that bites like that uh, is not necessarily a tariff like that when you get more, more complicated. Uh, and what I want to do here is talk about some of those complications because I think they're at the crux of what may go wrong. Uh, the first thing to note is that if you put on the tariff, the revenue that's collected from duties goes to the government. If you put on a quota, the revenue goes to the producers abroad. Okay, well, that's a loss for the country of a little bit of revenue. Does that matter? When it goes to the producers abroad, their, quote, their profits go up. And when their profits go up, they can reinvest more. Not true of the country uh, that has imposed the tariffs. So consumers in the country imposing the tariffs pay twice. Once in higher prices, in this case for steel, uh, where the, and, once, and for steel products whose costs have risen, and therefore, and once in the, in the uh, whatever fiscal compensation you need to make up the target fiscal that you would otherwise have had. So you've got a balanced budget, and you lo don't lose the tariff revenue, you've got to get something else. To be sure, as demand rises with income or changes for other reasons, the same quota does not yield the same tariff equivalent. Uh, obviously, if demand rises and you're only allowing the same number, the equivalent tariff, or sorry, quote, demand rises, uh, then the quota equivalent of the tariff is right, or the tariff equivalent of quota is rising over time. Moreover, if the domestic import competing industry is oligopolistic, the response may be different under a tariff than it would be under a quota in that and other cases. Nonetheless, the argument goes, at any point in time, they're the same, and that's probably true. But there are more costs than the simple calculation of, okay, the price rose, and so they pay more, leads to. Especially with intermediate goods and raw materials, the economic costs must include those of the user industries whose cost rose and whose competitiveness relative to imports therefore falls unless they too are protected and pressures for that will, as I shall argue later, surely increase in the case of the steel tariffs. When tariffs are at different rates for different items, customs officials must be checked, as I indicated, to ensure that the goods being imported are of the tariff classification came. There are over 10,000 different categories of tariff in the U.S. tariff code, 10,000. <clears> Some countries have as many as 28,000, and it depends at what level you look and so on and so forth. When Chile was liberating its trade regime, at first rates were reduced by formula so that any, all tariffs would go down 50%, meaning that an 80% tariff would go to 40, a 50% tariff would go to 25, etc. But with all of that, producers finally began complaining that nobody ever knew what the tariff would be, and all producers together from all industries went to the government and said, we want one uniform tariff rate for everybody to stop all this. They went to a 5% tariff with one exception, but that doesn't matter. After the businessmen had complained that the delay is just in finding the right rate and getting through customs were big enough uh, to be a problem there. 
But administration of quotas is even more complicated. When quote tariffs are commodity specific, quotas are commodity and country specific. If there are 10,000 class tariff classifications, and there are 162 countries in the WTO, and if a country covered all imports with quotas, that means that there wouldn't be 1,620,000 different tariff country combinations, uh, that were against which the country of origin rate and the commodity classification would have to be checked. Even when it is only steel uh, and quotas are applicable only to a few countries, all the imports of steel, and there are 54 different varieties of Korean steel subject to quota, must be checked to ensure that they were not transshipped from a, another country. Because, of course, you could transship it through Korea or the other way around. You'd profit depending on what you're doing with which. Uh, when the exports of a particular type of steel were be below quota from the quota affected country, other exporters of the product could transship through the producer in that country to fill the quota and, of course, vice versa. This did, by the way, happen repeatedly when the U.S. imposed quotas on textiles and apparel. Transshipment was a major problem, even for enforcement in the U.S. The Koreans learned, only after the agreement went into effect, that exports of nine of the 54 categories had already been filled for the year. They could export no more, even though, of course, companies had orders, uh, contracts had been placed, and all the rest of it. For other categories, the Commerce Department very quickly thought about it, or didn't think about it. They realized they had to do something. And so in, instead of having an annual allocation, they decided the exemption would be good for a year, but you could only import in quarterly installments, i.e. three months, and you could only import one quarter at a time. So a company with a st strong se seasonal business still had to lay in its inventory ahead of time. It could not do otherwise. A country, company whose demand was rising during the year could do nothing about it as, and can do nothing about it, and so on and so forth. It builds tremendous rigidity into the system, but failing to do so would mean that people would be rushing to get their goods in at the beginning of the year and the docks would be crowded on uh, the 1st of January, as has happened in some cases, uh, so that's not a good idea either. The Koreans obviously judged that the quantity reduction in steel exports would enable them to sell in the U.S. market at a higher price <coughs> than they would otherwise receive, and thus increase total profits by receiving uh, that price for the 70 percent more than they would for the 100 percent at the tariff ribbon price. The increased profit per unit uh, under the quota at the co was, as I said, at the cost of American consumers. The differences between tariffs and quotas are not small in that regard, but there are many more. When there's a tariff, anyone who wants to import at the prevailing tariff price, written price is free to do so. With a quota, there has to be a mechanism for allocating import licenses across competing claimants in either the importing or the exporting country, and the quota is allocation mechanism, as well as the size of the quota, is very likely to have implications for industrial organization and behavior of producers in both countries. Almost any mechanism has cost of those in addition to the tariff, in addition to the time and resources I've already talked about. They do depend on the mechanism of allocation, and that's something that's never addressed to my knowledge in the discussion of tariff quota equivalents. And I start by noting that the tariff quota recipients receive something of value, i.e. the tariff cost, without paying for it to the allocator, and except if the quota is auctioned, and if it is auctioned, it's the same as a tariff to all purposes. But it's good business to seek something for nothing or to expend a few resources to gain something of greater value. And greatest value of all would be, of course, to be attained when you get an exemption from the quota and you don't have to pay the tariff, which is, of course, what will happen in some of the Korean cases. The simplest allocation is first come, first serve applicants. In that case, however, foreign exporters will rush to ship the beginning of the quota period, and uh, we don't run into problems immediately. Officials in the quota imposing country will need to keep a record of the country commodity specific imports of how much has been imported by whom and under which category. And the period in that uh, they, that would, they would have to cut off imports and ship things back or stock them in the uh, in warehouses or something for anything that came in over quota if there was no mechanism to stop it in the exporting country. When the authorities anywhere in the world have begun a first-come, first-served mechanism, they've almost very quickly abandoned it because of its obvious deficiencies. One thing you can tell is when all those things are piling up in the dock, something is wrong. One amendment which happened was, of course, to make the uh, quarterly allocation so they don't arrive then. But 
the quarterly allocation implies excess costs for small consumers because they have to import very small goods. And of course, you, when you can use a, a big load at once, it's less, so the costs go up for the small guys. The cost of obtaining a license probably do not increase proportionately with the quantity requested or granted. So the system in that regard, again, gives an edge to the large importers of the quarter ridden country. Quarterly imports must also mean excessive inventories for firms facing seasonal demands and excessive costs for companies over opti overly optimistic in their demand forecasts. In addition, any company facing unanticipated increased demand would be unable to fill orders until a new waiver was received. That in turn means that there's a barrier, an almost prohibitive barrier to the entry of any new firms. And meanwhile, the, even the inefficient firms getting the quotas will be able to stay in business. So you've knocked out the mechanism or one of the mechanisms by which you get improved efficiency within a category. Uh, the, in the case of steel tariff quotas in Korea, the administrative costs, and we're not very far into it, are already substantial. A first step had to be to hire steel specialists by the Department of Commerce who needed to oversee imports, who needed training to oversee imports of steel and exemption requests made by steel users. Locating steel specialists was surely not easy. As of June, the Washington Post reported the search was underway for then an additional 30 people to be trained to do that. Now remember, they've got to know a lot about steel, and they'll find out why in a minute. So imagining you to find that number of people and that sort of thing in that case is already difficult. The number of exemption requests was far greater than had been anticipated, which should not surprise you. Uh, the uh, Trump administration had announced that it expected about 4,500 requests for exemptions. As of November 1st, the Department of Commerce reported there had been 75,446, to be precise. 4,500 versus 75,000. Uh, it was reported that not a single request for exemption from a steel producing company had been turned down. They all got it. The requests from retailers for exemptions, four-tenths of 1% were approved, and I could go on. I mean, the approval, you'd like to know what the uh, administrators of these quotas really thought about. I tried, actually, to look at the list of what would have been approved, and I did get it up on my PC, but it turned out uh, there were 33,019 pages, a very small print to a rough approximation as I tried to guesstimate how many there were, and I didn't even try in that list for the commodities. Now, a separate request has to be filed for each of the 54 types of steel by each firm. If two firms are producing the same kind, they can't use the same request. They've got to have their own. To file a request, a firm has to specify the type of metal, including its 10-digit tariff code. It has to specify the chemical composition of the steel. Okay, It has to specify the finish of the steel. It has to specify the strength and dimensions. So if you're going to import half-inch pipe and one-inch pipe, that is two separate requests. It does not come in on the same waiver request whatsoever. Uh, and they have to also report their efforts to procure that particular type of steel from a domestic source. Okay, so the firm has to go in and get letters saying that we can't sell you that, we can't sell you that. Well, you can imagine companies that want the business are a little bit optimistic about whether they can make that. And of course, once they say that, then the quota is denied, in which case, of course, it's, the guy is hung. And all of this is administrative, and all of this does not show up in what you hear when you just hear that, okay, they put a quota on steel, to, on steel to imports. It's far more complicated than that. Now imagine that you go in and you get training for a week, which is what they got. And now you're going to be an inspector of steel coming in. Do you think you could do it? Were you a chemist? If you think a chemistry major could do it, I'm sure they couldn't. I mean, I think this is really unbelievable as to any optimistic expectation whatsoever. And again, apparently delays are beginning to pile up, although I could not find any reasonable documentation. Somehow the Department of Commerce page was blank on that particular subject. I don't know why. The original announcement of procedures for applications for waivers was, was announced last April. Once an application is received, it's supposed to be posted for 30 days, during which pro domestic producers can contest it. So within 30 days, uh, you, when you get it in, you say, I've already asked so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. But then you post it, and if anybody else says, I can produce it, they're back in the soup, and it will be most likely denied. Until a week ago, there was no appeal procedure. They have now announced they're working on one. Uh, if there was no, no objection, then there was presumed to be the waiver would be granted. The Washington Post reported that one company had filed 1,168 exclusion requests, with the average company in June, only in June, 
having filed more than three dozen requests that month. One company. There are about 5,000 companies producing steel. Already in April, transshipment efforts were reported and trying to be enforced as countries such as Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia were trying to get around all these rules and regulations. Note that even though there are only 54 types of subject, steel subject to quotas in chorus, all steel imports must be checked to ensure that they're not just misspecified as some other quota with, or some other type with a quota or ten, tariff of 10% or something like that. It's amazing how complicated you can get very quickly, and that's almost my point. As I said, waivers or exclusions are valid only for a year, uh, but imports can enter only quarterly. So once again, we have this rigidity in the system, and the defects are obvious. The de incentive for applicants to ask for more than they will actually use is, of course, very strong, since any excess can be sold in the domestic market. A next step will therefore be to make any resale illegal, of course, which will, in turn, which will be difficult to enforce. It will leave unwanted inventory in the hands of those recipients who get more than they anticipated in cases where demand falls. For items where the demand shifts upward, as demand has sometimes been known to do, say for construction materials after a hurricane, the rigidity in the system presents an obvious cost because nobody will be able to get the extra steel until they get all of this, and that takes time. Alternative mechanisms to allocate quotas have been done, made elsewhere, but uh, basically most of them have defects that are even stronger than what I'm describing here. Uh, the government of India found several real gems along the way that uh, cost even more than these did. Uh, licenses can be issued on demand until the quotas are filled, but that doesn't work very well. License can be allocated in proportion to historical use, which freezes in shares, rules out new entrants, and keeps in business all the uh, low productivity guys. Uh, they can be allocated by a producer's association. Guess what that does? You create an oligopoly, right, of all the producers who do it. And they all have flaws. The Korean authorities are reported to have asked their steel Asso producers association to allocate the licenses among themselves. That makes a nice oligopoly, I think. Uh, although the U.S. authorities have to check the imports anyway to make sure that other uh, countries obeying what it's agreed to do. Obviously, such a mechanism blunts competition among steel producers. They, they can't compete in the American market uh, and certainly prevents new entrants. I tried to think about what the incentive was for pricing of a, steel, a Korean steel company in the Producers Association who has his allotment and what the incentives were on the un, United States side to try and do anything when they've already boxed in and they have their allocation and so on and so forth. But it's very hard to think through it. And I couldn't do it, but I'm sure it's complicated and I'm sure it does not add uh, to productivity, growth, well-being, or what have you. Learning about the inefficiencies of quota allocation system has been stimulated mostly by the experience of countries where import licensing and quantitative controls over imports were the major mechanism instead of the exchange rate for allocation of scarce foreign exchange. And foreign exchange itself was on the scarcity because the incentives went to the import substitution industries. In the U.S., some experience was gained uh, from our sugar regime, which was quite a crazy, which had tariff quotas, and the U.S. price was approximately double the world price for years. In case you think that the United States is immune to all this and we'll have this nice clean system where the t everybody looks and says the tariff quota this kind of steel is 10, so they'll bring it in and that's that. Uh, customs inspectors found that a cake mix, in quotes, uh, was being imported in large quantities, so large that it raised suspicions after a while, from a plant, Canadian plant in Toronto to a factory in Buffalo. It turned out what was happening was that the mix made in Canada of cake mix was 95% sugar. The factory in Buffalo removed the flour, and there was nothing else in it anyway, and then, of course, sold the sugar at a big profit because the sugar price in the U.S. was twice that in Canada. Very simple. Make a big profit, and, but as you can imagine, there's not much useful economic activity in all this. And I've got lots of other stories, but I don't think they'll let me talk that long here. Uh, there are still other effects of the arrangement. Uh, a lot of the discussion is focused on the job creation that this tariffs might ask, enable. It's too soon to tell what will happen to employment in the U.S. steel industry, but there are about 145,000 workers employed in the industry at the beginning of 2018, and an estimated 16 times that number in steel-using industries. 16 times. We don't know what that will do, but in 2002, President Bush imposed voluntary export restraints on steel, equivalent to a quota on steel imports. One study found that 6,000 jobs were gained in the steel production when they had 185,000 to start. And more than 200,000 workers were lost, or 200,000 workers' jobs, 
in steel using industries. According to that estimate, of course, more jobs were lost in steel industries, steel using industries, than the total number employed in steel production. You lost more than that in steel using as you tried to protect jobs. Doesn't make much sense. By June 5th, the price of hot rolled steel in the U.S. cost $329 a ton more than it did in, in Europe, where the price was $421. 329. So it was 750 here and 421 there. That gave Europeans a cost advantage of about 56%. Given that cost differential, what do you think due to the competitive position of steel users, such as autos, farm machinery, mechanical equipment, and much more? It's hard to believe that the Trump administration will not hear from the auto industry, the farm machinery industry, and so on. And when they hear, it's hard to believe that we won't hear tariffs on those. We won't have other quotas. We'll, and the system will be a poison, the, the cancer that moves on and on, unless somebody could reverse it fairly quickly. Another lesson, however, is that protection, once started, is like a cancer, because everybody knows their costs went up because of everybody else. Because it's very confusing, and you can't judge who's competitive and who's really uh, just basically using the argument, et cetera, et cetera. Some steel users are exporters, and they will surely suffer, uh, but nonetheless, and we can't protect them. It's likely that even if protection stops at steel and aluminum, or extends to autos, or goes beyond that, the net result will be a reduction in exports and employment in steel using industries at least great enough to offset any marginal reduction in imports and increases in employment in exporting industries. Trump administration has stated that their goals, when they're not telling you this also national security, they've told you they really want to protect jobs and they want to cure the U.S. deficit. Neither the jobs nor the deficit is going to be affected in the direction that they say they want by these measures. It's going to be the other way around. Jobs will be lost and, of course, in addition, uh, it's either likely to leave the deficit unaffected or increase it. Trade has been an important spur for growth, global growth in the U.S., and for many reasons in addition to those I've discussed today. In fact, if I were to tell you the most important reason why I think this is sheer insanity, I would mention geopolitical factors rather than economic ones. But this is the economics. I'll leave that to the political scientists who know better. But if you think it's only damage in the direct economic relations, you're forgetting that we have some other countries in the world and both soft power and hard power dictate that we do otherwise. It is to be hoped that the follies of protection soon become sufficiently evident that American policy will revert quickly to support for open multilateral trading system and move to strengthening it before more damage is done. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks like the licensing Raj has migrated from <laughs> India to Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the licensing Raj was basically a system of licensing and uh, tariff uh, quota allocations in India. And uh, we had a huge Indian bureaucracy that sort of masqueraded as economic policy making down there at the time. But, uh, and uh, before I open up to Q&A over here, I'd like to continue along Trump's follies. You've written a very interesting article on Trump's North American charade, which has to do with the new, new NAFTA or the USMCA, as it's now being called. And in that, you talk about the protection that's been given to automobile industries, and that has also been mentioned in the media. Can you tell us something more about other dimensions of that agreement? Uh, and how does, is there anything in the new agreement that is in any way, shape, or form better than what is in NAFTA? Or is it all a disaster? Uh, well, the first part of the answer is, of course, as you know, there's a TPP proposed. Right. Uh, the TPP had improvements o over NAFTA in a number of things. And some of that did carry through a bit. Once he decided he didn't want the TPP, then he thought those were good things, and he did, or they, Light, Lighthouser, et cetera, right. put them in that. So there's a little bit of that, but not an awful lot. Uh, and there are some other things that go the other way. Uh, it's not at all clear as yet what the final denouement on some of these things will be because the wording of the thing has to be sorted out, and there's some really tricky questions there. And on top of that, of course, it has to be passed by Congress, right. and Congress isn't happy, so we don't know for sure what will happen there either. Having said that, there are a number of things that quite clearly are almost certainly worse. 
Uh, there's one provision, which is sheer madness, but I guess will be so, in fact, it's so insane that I doubt if it will directly make any difference. And that, oh, I should start by saying the, the, the minimum wage in the U.S. is about $7.50 right now. Uh, the average wage in the auto industry, as best you can tell, and depending how you break it out, and I've broken out three ways and got different numbers, is on the order of $15 an hour, about. Very rough. The new agreement for Mexico, not Canada, just Mexico, says that Mexico must, Mexican companies exporting the United States of auto and auto parts, and the auto parts is important, must, and I'll come back to domestic content in a minute, pay the worker, the workforce, $16 an hour average for 60%, I think is now the number, but it's changed, of their production. This is, the Mexican minimum wage is $2. The Mexican wage right now in the auto workers is 4 They're already getting twice, and now they're selling to 16 Now, as I said, it's so high that I don't think they'll do it. I think there is right now, however, a 2.5% tariff on auto imports in general. If the Trump administration does what I think it will do, it will use that and the pressure from the auto companies to raise the auto tariff to the 25% level. And once it's done that, all kinds of other things will go wrong. Okay, we don't have that as yet. And of course, I could be wrong. I'd love to be wrong on that one because that's gonna be another big mess. Um, but having said that, that's one thing. There is also, the, the one of the bad things about free trade agreements is that there are rules of origin. And the rule of origin says that in order to be eligible for the free trade agreement says you may bring your goods into our country duty free. A rule of origin says, well, of course, you, you've got to have such and such a domestic content percentage in your country in order to bring it in. And there's a reason for that if you want to have a free trade agreement. Namely, if you don't have anything, then uh, if Mexico has zero tariffs, for example, and the U.S. has a tariff, uh, everything will be imported through Mexico and shipped to the United States. So if you're going to have a free trade agreement, you have to have a rule of origin to prevent this transshipment in ways that will avoid the tariff if that's what you want to do. Uh, I'm not sure you should want to do it, but that's a different issue. <clears throat> that said, the rule of origin already in autos was high at 62.5% and has been raised to 75 right. Now I'm guessing that they, that's because the Trump administration thought that some people would be paid the $16 an hour, which would then raise the domestic content statistically. I don't think it will happen that way. So I think the $16, which is outrageous, uh, and the idea that a poor country should pay that. We always talk in international trade about, okay, uh, we are rich, we have lots of capital, it isn't quite expensive, they're poor, they've got an unskilled labor that has paid less. That's what they do relatively well, so they should do it, we'll be better off than that. But no, that's not what we're saying. We're saying they have to pay higher wages because otherwise it's unfair competition with American workers, which does not strike me as the best of all arguments. But those, those are pretty much the big ones. And lest you think that, why am I so worried about automobiles? That's a very big chunk of what developed after NAFTA came about because the North American value added chain developed where parts and so on that are unskilled labor using got produced in Mexico. And the parts that are capital using and so on got produced in the United States and Canada. And the trade back and forth, three-way trade flow, everybody's producing things more cheaply than anybody could produce if they produced everything from their own country. So it's one of those things where everybody's gaining. Even the automobile producers have said they did not want it. The steel workers have said they think Canada should be included in the, in the steel exemption business. They think sales should not have to do it. So even the people who are supposedly going to benefit are objecting, which tells you how bad tariffs are. Well, unfortunately, it seems that uh, all the advice we were giving the developing countries not to do is now coming right home over here. That's another objection. Anyway, uh, let me open it to questions and answers uh, from the audience. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation, and uh, please make it a question. Thank you. Bob Hammond from Sudan, Minnesota, the Iron Range. In my younger days, I worked in the mines, and I had transferable skills, so I transferred them. And my question is, uh, the state of Minnesota is trying to permit a copper mining industry. So seeing the market challenges for our iron mining industry, relatively low grade ore body, and it appears that the copper mining industry is doing the same thing. It's on a global scale, low-grade ore body, shouldn't we anticipate that a copper mining industry would be in the same boat as our iron mining industry as the years go by? 
The honest answer is I don't know. Uh, and really, I can't know uh, because I don't know enough about it, and we don't know enough about it. But what, what I guess I would, my answer would be that if copper mining is undertaken by private firms who think it's a worthwhile venture and they use their money, the beauty of private enterprises is that if they're wrong, they pay. If the state gets involved, if they're wrong, we pay. And I guess I'm for a system where if people are willing to put their money where their mouth is and want to do it, and you don't find any reason that the really costs are grossly distorted somehow or other, let them try it if that's what they want to do. But don't make me, the taxpayer, pay for the mistakes they make. Phil Levy from Northwestern University and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I want to ask about something other than steel, that one of the things we've had um, Robert Lighthizer talk about is that it was a mistake to let China into the WTO. So you've said, you've laid out some of the very compelling arguments for free trade. Do these apply when you have a country which has a larger state role in the economy as a trading partner? Well, again, that's a complicated question. Uh, the first, my answer would be that the countries that have tried in state trading on a large scale, and I have in mind the former Soviet Union, and I have in mind uh, India to a great degree and the state company, uh, and so on, have found the state enterprises perform very badly for a whole variety of some very good reasons. I mean, the fact that there's no budget constraint, they can get the subsidy, state firms can get their wages driven up more easily, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I guess my own view is that there's something to the argument, in the, in the case of China, there's something to the argument that, well, they built so much steel capacity uh, that they overdid it and they've affected world markets, and that's surely true. Uh, but on the other hand, the answer to that is not for the U.S. to put on steel quotas and then let the Europeans get the cheaper <coughs> steel so that their autos will outcompete American automobiles or whatever. The answer has what I've thought been at the World Trade Organization to do something so it's a multi, in fact of all the things where multilateralism is important, trade is very high on the list. And the Trump administration's failure to recognize that. And something like I didn't have time in the talk to talk about third countries and their effects. Korea, if they lose share, will lose it to other countries, et cetera, et cetera. You can go on and on in this regard. Uh, but in the Chinese case, I do. My, my own guess is on these uh, 25 industries that uh, President Xi wants to uh, promote by 2025, uh, the American response ought to be, well, let's see what they can do. Good luck. And my guess is that the more the government gets into it, the less well they'll do and the less competitive they'll be. Not that I necessarily wish that for them, but I, get, I think our judgment of how competitive they can be by doing it via the government is overdone. There are exceptions that there have been a few, but they've been very few. Uh, and the second part, part of that story, I think very clearly, is that the Chinese uh, would have to relax their controls and what have you to a fair degree if they did that. So uh, I, I, I would guess that that 25 industries by 2025 is not going to happen the way he wants to do it unless we force them more inward looking because uh, we've, we've basically made this mistake. And if we do that, then some of those industries might be developed in that hothouse and become more competitive. The last thing to be said is, uh, again, being old is not an advantage, but it, there are some things you learn. And it's how, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at a headline in the paper in the past year or so about something that the Trump administration, Lighthizer, somebody says about trade, and where he's talking about China, and where I could strike out the word China, strike the word Japan, go back 30 years and find that statement as a headline in some paper then. We panicked in the 1980s about Japan. Now we're panicking about China. The U.S. economy is much stronger. This makes no sense. Thank you. My name is Steve Peterson. I'm a student. You commented that the administration has advanced the argument that there will be some revenue to be realized by the Treasury from the tariffs. Has that amount been quantified? Can you talk a little louder, please? I'm sorry. You commented that there that the administration has projected that it will realize some revenue from the tariffs. Has that amount been quantified? Well, I mean, we know what tariff, we know what steel is, and we know how much is being cut back, so we know how much would not be uh, subject to tariff, but the tariff revenue is minuscule. Uh, if, even if it's 25% tariff, you're at a very low number relative to anything in the U.S. budget. And a lot of, of course, the cost comes to consumers and not to the U.S. taxpayer immediately. Some comes to the taxpayer by lost revenue. Uh, and some comes because we have lost income because we're not doing things productively. And that means higher tax rates to get the same revenue. Uh, but it, but it, the, the direct loss by, thir, thir, by losing 30% or thereabouts of Korean exports to the U.S., the tariff revenue on that isn't that much. The estimate was in the 1980s when we did the same thing with Japanese cars. Uh, that the value the Japanese producers 
got the extra profits they got per car was $2,000, which at the time an American car averaged about uh, 12 or $13,000, so it was not a trivial amount and did have a great deal to do with the loss of competitiveness of U.S. companies. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Scarborough. I'm president of Litigation Analytics and recently made an affiliate, uh, research affiliate at the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute. Um, I don't really have a question. Um, before coming here from Connecticut uh, today, um, last night I went through my three University of Minnesota spiral notebooks of my <laughs> notes in your class. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Um, I think some of you will appreciate how difficult it was to take notes from Professor Kruger um, <laughs> because of all the information that she gave us so rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> I once counted the number of times that you said, you know, um, uh -oh. I put a mark uh, each time in a class and it was 47. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's and amazing <laughs> when I go through those how much we learn from you. I don't know if anyone else here can go back 50 years like Armin and I can when we sat in her class, but it really has brought back some wonderful memories, and I'm just very glad that you're here. Uh, Rosalinda. Um. I can attest to what he has said, <laughs> even though I was not here 50 years ago. Uh, I came on in 1979, um, expecting, I mean, I came because Anne was here, but she was on a sabbatical. <laughs> I, I still have palpitations, but she came back in 1980 when I met her. And I actually had to tape her classes. And when um, I started to do the dissertation with Anne, uh, Ms. Delma Burns, her secretary, would say, how much time do you want? And I would think, like, seven minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I will ask a couple of questions and then listen, uh, because that, that will give me a lot of work um, going forward uh, to figure out what she has said and, and to figure out what I had to do. Now, one of the amazing things of Anne as a professor. You could see in the lecture how she moves from micro behavior to general equilibrium, from general equilibrium to macro, back to micro behavior, and you have to have consistency. If you had that, the way she, she thinks and she processes information, to the level not only of what textbooks or math tell you, but to the level of what is the operation of a quantitative restriction? What is the, the, the way it works at the ports of entry? Then you will have no problems with your dissertation. But that was a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, uh, I, I know that many of you probably are thinking, how does she find out all this information? Well, she does. <laughs> and, and, and if you work with her, you also do. You figure it out. So I just want to thank Anne for uh, giving us these uh, precious international economics uh, courses that were a intense, a privilege, and a lot of fun. <laughs> My name is Larry Seigstetter. I'm a former student here at the university economics department, uh, not a student of yours. But I, I have a question about economic sanctions. Do you have a view on sanctions policy these days? It seems to be an overused policy tool that may be leading to a lot of making a lot of enemies around the world. And I'm wondering what you have to say about that. Well, on the, eco on the economics side, uh, sanctions are difficult because they have to be universal. Uh, one of the, I mean, the ease of transshipment is so great. Uh, the evidence, everything I read for years during the Iraq War, <clears throat> where there were supposed to be embargoes and stuff, stuff was just going across the Jordanian border. And that happens over and over again. It's going to happen now with Iran. The one time where sanctions seem to have been moderately effective, and I'm not even sure they were effective then, but they, at least people think they were effective, was South Africa, where it was universal, it was UN. 
And with, when you do that and you really cut them off, it can be very effective. Now, what the U.S. government has discovered, which is both good and bad, is that because of the U.S. financial system, if you cut companies in Iran, for the oil companies, for example, off from the U.S. payment system, that's devastating because they can't get a hold of things, they can't buy things, they can't sell things, and so on. But it has to be fairly complete. And notice that already there are questions and the government is chasing down this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and who was it just the other day violated sanctions and got a penalty? There was somebody just last week, a big penalty for violating the U.S. sanctions on that. So the financial sanctions seem to be able to be more effective because you, you, you're cutting off their purchasing power too. Uh, whereas the commodity sanctions are not so effective because the goods can get smuggled out and smuggled in more easily. Uh, so I think my, my general conclusion would be that sanctions on, on goods are a very bad policy. Sanctions on a country by way of cutting off their finances are a tremendously potent policy, so you want to be sure you don't use them too soon because you don't have them in your army too long. So I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical in general, but I'm much more skeptical on the goods side than I am on the finance side. And there seems to be some consensus that even uh, where it's a sanction on, sanctions on individuals, for example, in Russia, uh, that there is enough pain from that, that there's some recognition of it. It is not uh, something that can be taken too lightly. But again, it's the financial sanctions. It's not the real ones that seem to make the difference. You've got Nick Hope back here, too. Nick? Yeah, I'm Nick Hope, um, and has been my boss several times, uh, most recently <laughs> at Stanford. Um, Let's, let's follow up on that, Anne, because, uh, as you know, I spend a lot of time looking at China. Um, it concerns me quite a bit that, that, as you suggest, the thing that will bite in Iran is the financial sanction, and you're telling companies that do business with uh, Iran that they'll be cut off from the use of the, the American financial system. Uh, what are your views about the incentive that that gives to the Russias, Chinas of the world to quickly innovate and come up with a, a different way of paying for this stuff. I mean, can you imagine, for example, the, the Iranians invoicing their oil in RMB? And although it's not yet a reserve currency, but finding ways to bypass the American payment system, at least to some extent, to ensure that they can continue the process. And I ask the question because I think given that, that Trump acted as if it was just the US and the Iranians in this agreement, neglecting the permanent members of the Security Council, Germany and the EU, that there'll be probably a lot of fellow travellers if, uh, mm. if these countries want to try and set up an alternative that may, in the end, erode the uh, primacy of the dollar in the national payment system. Mm -hmm. yeah, just to elaborate, uh, the sanctions against Iran have been effective to the extent they've been because they are enforced through the financial mechanism, not through the real mechanism, which is what Nick is saying. Uh, and They quite clearly have more of an effect and so on. I have been a little bit surprised that there hasn't already been more of a development of alternative financial instruments. It has to be harder than I thought it would be to do so. But my general view is that once you set up an incentive to do it, somebody's going to figure out a way. But in this case, it does not seem to have happened as fast as I would have thought. That doesn't mean it won't happen. And I guess the answer ought to be that the longer those sanctions persist, the more likely it is that such and such that mechanism will develop. The more it develops, the more like losses will be before shifted to the US side, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know, and I don't know, I don't understand quite why they're as effective as they are. Well, Anne, uh, let me close by asking you a final question. Nothing to do with trade. <laughs> What made you get interested in economics? <laughs> and why did you get interested and specialize in international economics? Now, the first part of the answer is I really don't know. I mean, when I, when I went to an undergraduate, you had to have a major. I think my, my instincts were toward the social sciences without question. And I enjoyed economics, uh, although I wasn't actually majoring in it completely until my senior year. So there, I don't know whether that was it or other things, I'm not sure. Uh, so that's the first part. I went to graduate school without really any clear-cut idea of what part of economics I would want to go into. Maybe I didn't know enough uh, to know what I wanted to do or anything. But, and in fact, I think I put up my applications. I wanted to go into economic theory. I don't think I went, I don't think I did that, but I took international as a field and stuff. And then I guess after a few years here, uh, I was beginning to work summers on international pro projects uh, in the US government and stuff. Uh, and more and more, I finally just moved in that direction. And that was what was interesting, and that was what was, to me, most fun. Well, thank you very much, Anne. This has been a wonderful evening. And, and for a session. 
Thank you, for Pre Professor Krieger, for the thoughtful lecture and discussion. At this time, I would like to ask uh, Professor Krieger and Dean Coleman to please prepare for the conferral ceremony, which will begin in a few moments. I would like to take a brief moment to recognize the legacy of Minnesota economics and the role that giants in the field like Professor Krieger have shaped the way we work. The Department of Economics at the University of Minnesota has for decades been recognized, been a recognized world leader in advancing economic science and producing its future leaders. Minnesota economics is known throughout the profession as combining theoretical rigor and the careful use of data to address economic questions. Our graduates, our graduates help populate the top economics departments, central banks, corporations, and government institutions worldwide. Our reputation rests on the work of these scholars who have nurtured an environment that is not only committed to academic excellence, but also to the belief that the best ideas are formed where research is critiqued and debated and where challenging the status quo is encouraged. That's a nice way of saying that we yell at each other. <laughs> Through theoretical rigor and the careful use of data, they are striving to answer the pressing economic questions of our time. It is this tradition of standing on the shoulders of the giants of the profession who came before us that we attempt to continue to this day. Most people view Walter Heller as one of the founding fathers of the department. A skilled economist, Heller also had a keen eye for academic talent. He brought together a faculty remarkable in both its quality and its breadth. John Turbel, Andreas Papandreou, future prime minister of Greece, Oswald Brownlee, Harlan Smith, John Buttrick, Ed Cohen, Franz Gerls, John Chipman, John Carrickin, Scott Maines, Richard Savage, and Frank Boddy. Heller's most significant recruiting coup was Leonid Hurwitch, a brilliant young economist hired in 1951 who, as we all know, went on to win the Nobel Prize in 2007. Together, Heller and Hurwitch went on to make strong hires in the late 1950s, bringing Martin Bronfenbrenner, Ann Krieger, Jim Simler and Ket Richter. And ever since, we've worked hard to recruit and retain the rising stars in economics, building upon this important foundation of standing on the shoulders of these great economists. With that, when they are ready, Dean Coleman will begin the degree conferral ceremony. Thank you. Since 1925, the University of Minnesota has awarded over 270 honorary degrees. And it is always a special occasion when one of our very own faculty is conferred with such a degree. As a college, as I mentioned earlier, we are tremendously proud of our economics department, which is historically ranked among the top in the world. The department's reputation rests on the work of scholars who have nurtured an environment that is committed to academic rigor. It rests also on the belief that excellence is best achieved, where ideas are critiqued and debated, and where challenging the status quo is encouraged. And you heard that in some of the, the comments after Professor Krieger's uh, lecture. Professor Krieger provides a perfect example of what has made Minnesota a hub of innovation in economic research and a destination for economists from around the world. Her creative, rigorous, and risk-taking work is a model for the next generation of economic scholars. And we are very fortunate to count her among our own and to be able to thank her and acknowledge her this evening with the Honorary Doctor of Science degree. I do want to add, um, well, I'll add two comments. One, 
as a political scientist, I also uh, benefited very heavily from Professor Krieger's work when I was writing my dissertation way back when. Uh, so her work certainly crosses disciplinary lines. So I was working on trade policy as part of my dissertation work. And um, so the reach is, is very far indeed. The second thing I want to say, and this is somewhat for the family and the friends in the room, uh, a cool fact for you to take away uh, today. One of the great things I get to do as a dean is participate in these honorary degree events. The last three that I have done, Daniel McFadden, Department of Economics, Nobel Prize winner, he got his PhD here. Last one I did, two months ago, Prince. And now today, Ann Krieger. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so with that, let me welcome to the podium our Executive Vice President and Provost, a CLA alum herself, Karen Hansen. Thank you very much, John. It is my great pleasure on behalf of the University of Minnesota to present the Honorary Doctor of Science degree to Professor Ann O. Krieger. This degree is the highest award that can be conferred by our university, and for Ann Krieger, it is so richly deserved. The nomination letters for this honorary degree movingly attest to the widespread influence Professor Krieger has had as a leader in the field of international economics for almost 50 years. Over more than four decades, Professor Krieger has contributed theoretical and empirical scholarship that has had enormous influence on thought and policy making related to economic development, international trade and finance, and economic policy reform. In addition to her important scholarship, she, she has shaped worldwide economic policy in leadership roles with the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, and as an advisor to governments and corporations around the world. She's credited by her nominators with, in the words of one, pulling millions of people out of poverty and having a tremendous effect on policymakers all over the developing world. Professor Krieger's lecture here today is one more manifestation of her continuing contributions to the fields of economics. And this honorary degree celebrates her connections to our university. Professor Krieger was a distinguished member of our faculty from 1959 to 1982. Former students have praised her as an extraordinary mentor and role model, an advisor who offered unwavering support, and a transformative teacher who invested a generous amount of time in each of us. In bestowing this honorary degree, we recognize and celebrate Professor Krieger's stellar intellectual career, her contributions to public service, and her exceptionally broad and deep influence on the next generation of economists. Professor Krieger, we're delighted to be able to honor you today as you have honored the University of Minnesota with your extraordinary contributions to the field of economics. So thank you very much and congratulations. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Shu, a member of the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents. Uh, thank you, Provost Hansen. Um, it's uh, an honor and a delight to be here uh, today on behalf of the Board of Regents. Um, this, is, uh, this is what uh, we're awarding today. I'm going to read this, and uh, then you also get a new hood, <laughs> a new hoodie. Um, this is not quite what was given to me, but I'll, I'll try and read through this. It's pretty dense. Uh, Doctor of Science, Ann O. Krieger, native of Endicott, New York, BA Economics, Oberlin College, 1953, MS, 1956, and PhD, 1959, and instructor, 1958 to 1959, Economics, University of Wisconsin, Assistant, 1959 to 1963, Associate, 1963 to 1966, and Full, 1966 to 1982, Professor of Economics, University of Minnesota, Senior Research Associate, National Bureau of Economic Research, 1978 uh, to present, I guess, right? 
and uh, Vice President, Economics and Research, World Bank, 1982 to 1986. Arts and Sciences Professor of Economics, Duke University, 1987 to 1993. First Deputy Managing Director, 2001 to 2006, and Special Advisor to the Managing Director, 2006 to 2007, International Monetary Fund, Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution, 1995 to 2001, Director, Center for Research in Economic Development and Policy Reform, 1997 to 2001. Pretty good so far? Okay. Uh, Harold L. and Caroline L. Richter, Professor of Humanities and Sciences, Department of Economics, 1993 to 2001. Emeritus, 2001 to present, and Senior Fellow, Stanford Center for International Development, 2012 to present. Stanford University, Professor of International Economics, School for Advanced International Studies, 2007 to 2012, and Senior Research Professor of International Economics, 2012 to present. Johns Hopkins University selected or elected to National Academy of Sciences, 1995. Because your pioneering work on economic development, economic policy reform, and international trade and finance have had profound international influence, because you introduced the concept of the rent-seeking society and revealed how rent-seeking affects the efficacy of government regulations, because you have made outstanding contributions to research on more than 30 countries, and because you are a respected leader in international economics who shifted the thinking within the world's lending institutions for economic development and poverty reduction. Congratulations. Give you this to re replace the one from Wisconsin. <laughs> How's that? That's good. All right. Would you like to say a few words? No. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is obviously a great honor, and as I already said earlier, but I'll say it again because it's more than twice true, and that is having so many friends, colleagues, former students here. It's a very moving day for me in many, many ways. Appreciate this a lot. Well, the economics department, when I got here in 1959, I was a very excellent department. And I don't mean only in the sense that it has been stated here, but it was a department that welcomed its new members. Uh, there was almost nothing that told you, you you are the new guy, you're the assistant or the professor or anything like that. From the beginning, uh, people took, you were taken in, you were part of it. There was nothing but encouragement. We are in the Heller Hurwitch. Institute here, uh, both of those men and many others uh, were just incredibly supportive, incredibly helpful, incredibly willing to spend their time and to make a major contribution. And insofar as I did whatever I did, I, I would say that it was partly because we had such a good department, not only those two, but many others. The department was viewed more like a baseball team where you have pitchers and catchers and so on. Well, we had international trade, we had public finance, we had theorists, we had econometricians, but everybody was contributing what they had to the sense of a department, and um, it was just a lovely place to be, to work, and to learn. So I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Krieger, and congratulations. Thank all of you for being here. Uh, we have a reception right next door, and I invite you to join us there. Thank you very much.